Dear friends, I'm coming to you from the Chofa Negev, the Negev coast, known by some as the Gaza Strip. I wanted to share some thoughts with everyone that have been ruminating in my mind as we approach Chag HaSukos Haba Aleinu Latova. There's a well-known, there's a well-known machlokas in the, in the Gemara and the Sukkah between Rabbi Kiva and Rabbi Lezer regarding the nature of the Sukkos that we are trying to commemorate. Kiva Sukkos of Shavti Es B'nei Yisrael Bo'utziyo Sama Eretz Misraim that I placed the Jewish people in huts in Sukkot when I took them out of Mitzrayim, when I took them out of Egypt. Rabbi Lezer holds that these Sukkot were not actual physical huts, but rather the Anani Akavod, these divine entities that the Jewish people were ensconced within while they traveled through the desert. Unklus, who was a Talmud, Unklus Hager, a student of, of Rabbi Lezer, also reflects this opinion in the Targum, where it says, Bimitale Anana, that in Sukkos of clouds, I carried the Jewish people through the desert. However, Rabbi Akiva, who was also a student of Rabbi Eleazar, says that these Sukkos were Sukkot Mamash. They were actual, literal Sukkot. Rabbi Nubachi, one of the Gedolei Harishonim, a Talmud of the, the, the Rashba, comments in his uh, very important sefer, Kad HaKemach, an encyclopedia of Jewish, of Jewish thought, that there is a, a very important concept that we learn from the prophets, that there, there, are, there are multi- there are multiple layers of meaning that are reflected in every concept that is put forward, an in inner expression and an outer expression. And like he quotes the pasuk from, uh, from 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 Mishlei, the, the the golden apples in a silver dish. So too is a good word said in its proper fashion. The golden apple is the internality, the internal message that is meant to be conveyed, and the silver dish is the is the mode of expression, is the is the is the is the outward expression of the thing. So it says Rabbeinu Bachai that this is actually what's going on in the conversation, in the dialogue between Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Lezer. That Rabbi Lezer is expressing the pnimiut, the internal conveyed message of the matter, of, of, of what the Sukkot were that the Jewish people experienced in the desert, whereas Rabbi Akiva is expressing the externality, what was the surface level experience of the Jewish people in the desert. Now to understand the significance of what is being conveyed over here, we need to ask, question of what is the significance of the date of the 15th of Tishrei. Right? All the dates that mark the major holidays of the Jewish people, the, to- the, the holidays that are listed in the Torah, we say that they are all Zecher Litziat Mitzrayim, that they are all important dates that, that, were, that were milestones in the progression of the Jewish people when they left Egypt. So we know the 15th of Nisan is the night that they actually left Egypt, that's the night of Pesach, the Lila Seder, Shavuot, 50 days later is when the Jewish people received the Torah. What actually took place on the 15th of, of Tishrei? It happens to be that it's five days following Yom Kippur, where the Jewish people received the second set of the Luchot, but was there a specific event that took place on that day? So the Gra, the Gaon of Vilna, says in his commentary on Shir Hashirim, a very, very important insight, that if we track the chronology, if we track the story from when the from when Moshe Rabbeinu ascended the mountain for the second time and was able to achieve uh, kapara, atonement for the Jewish people. And he was able to bring down, after a third round of 40 days, he was able to bring down the second tablets to the Jewish people on Yom HaKippur. The Jewish people immediately began building the Mishkan. And as the Psukim there lay out in detail, there was a process of first Moshe giving over the commandments of what the Mishkan entailed, and the Jewish people gathering those materials and then bringing them into a central holding bay, so to speak, in order to build it. That process took four days. The process of Moshe Rabbeinu coming down from the mountain, giving over the instructions for the Mishkan, gathering the materials for the Mishkan, that process took four, four days. As it says in the verse at the end of Sefer Shemos, Vehem heviu baboker baboker, that they continued bringing the process of bringing the materials took this period of time, and at the end, the Jewish people began constructing the Mishkan. The 15th of Tishrei, concludes the Gra, is the day that the Jewish people began building the Mishkan. Began building the Mishkan. The significance of beginning to build the Mishkan is, in its deepest essence, the idea that the Jewish people, and mankind more broadly, the actions of human beings are able to be resting places for the divine spirit to be manifested in the world. That is the underlying assumption 
That is the underlying basis for the entire structure of the Mishkan, and by extension, all the Bate Mikdash that the Jewish people would build throughout the ages, culminating in the actual Beit HaMikdash in Jerusalem. That is the basis for this activity, that we are engaging in the world, we are building things in the material world, and those structures, those activities, those endeavors become resting places for the Divine Presence. The Gemara in Shavuot, uh, or to be more accurate, the Mishnah in Shavuot, discusses the procedure for, for, for expanding the city of Jerusalem. There's a way for expanding the borders of Jerusalem, and there is a very, uh, very uh, let's say, elaborate ritual that's involved in this process for expanding, for expanding, first of all, the city, and then for expanding the Temple Mount. And during this ritual, which there is a big procession and there's a series of sacrifices that are brought, one of the things that is done is that, that a certain song is sung, a certain, a certain chapter of Tehillim is sung during this procession, and says the Gemara that this song was known as Shir Shel Pigaim, the song of the afflicted ones, perhaps Shir Shel Nigaim, that's another version that the Gemara brings, but be that as it may, there is this song of the afflicted that is sung during this, during this procedure, during this ritual. Says the Gemara, what is Shir Shel Pigaim, or Pigaim? What is this song? Says the Gemara, this is none other than Tehillim, Sandi Aleph, Yoshev Beseter Elyon, that I will dwell in the shadow of the On High, meaning expanding Jerusalem or expanding the Temple Mount is expanding the shadow of the On High. That is what is taking place. It's the shadow of On High that is being expanded. Rashi there brings a very, very interesting comment that this parak of Tehillim, of Yoshev Beseter Elyon, was in fact the prayer of Moshe Rabbeinu that was said at the construction of the original Mishkan. And he quotes the Pasuk from the end of Sefer Shemos, this period of this period of the story that we just discussed a moment ago, that after Moshe comes down from the mountain with the second set of tablets and begins the instructions to build the Mishkan. After that whole procedure is done, right before they begin to erect the actual structure, it says, Vayivarech Otam Moshe, that Moshe blessed them. Now, in the Psukib in Sefer Shamos, it doesn't say what the, what the content of the blessing was. It just says that he blessed them. It says Rashi, this was the content of the blessing. Tehillim Tzadi Aleph was the content of the blessing. And what was the blessing? Shetishre Shechina B'Maaseh Yedeihem. And adds Rashi a very interesting line. V'hi Noam Hashem Elokeinu Aleinu U'Maaseh Yadeinu Konenehu. Now, for those people who are experts in Sefer Tehillim, they know that that is not from Tehillim Tzadi Aleph 91, but rather that is the last verse of the previous chapter. That's the last verse of Tehillim Tzadi. Tehillim Tzadi ends with V'inoam Hashem Elokeinu Aleinu, that the pleasantness of God should be upon us, Aleinu Konena Aleinu, and the works of our hands should be stable. And then that segues immediately in to the first verse of chapter 91, which is Yoshev Beseter Elyon, that we will dwell in the shadow of the On High. What is being told to us is, is that these two chapters of Tehillim are in fact a continuum. They are a continuum. And you don't need Rashi to even tell that to you, because the beginning of Tehillim, chapter 90, is what? Tefillah the Moshe Ish HaElohim. This is the prayer of Moshe, the man of God. These two chapters of Tehillim are, let's say, two sides of the same coin, perhaps. Moshe is praying to Hashem for the success of the impossible task of building a house for the Creator. Adonai, ata hayit alanu, ma'on ata hayit alanu, l'dor vador. You have been our dwelling. You have been our dwelling this entire time. Since Beterim Harim Yuladu V'techolol Eretz, since the beginning of creation, you have been our dwelling. We dwell within you. As one of the, as one of the sign-off lines of Moshe Rabbeinu in Parashat Bezot HaBracha, Ma'ona Elohei Kedem, that God is the eternal dwelling place. As the Midrash Rabbah says in, in, uh, in, uh, in Bereshus Rabbah, Ma'ona Elohei Kedem, Shehu Ma'ono Shalolam, for he is the dwelling place of the world, Ve'ein Ha'olam Ma'ono, that the world, he does not dwell within the world. In other words, God is not in the world. The world is in God. God is the ultimate dwelling. So if God is the dwelling place of the world, if God is our house, so to speak, how is it that we are supposed to create a house for him? It's an impossible task. As Shlomo, many centuries later, when he would build the final, 
the final place of the of the of the mikdash of the Jewish people in Yerushalayim. He raises his hands at the inauguration ceremony and says, "God, you are can, you uh, the whole the whole heavens and the earth cannot contain you. How am I supposed to contain you in this small little house?" The impossible task of having the infinitude of the divine resting upon the finite actions of human beings is what Moshe Rabbeinu is praying for. Tfilah le Moshe Ish Elohim. This was the prayer of Moshe that the small, infinitesimal contribution of human beings can be enough to be a resting place for the infinite, vast, divine. And this last pasuk of Tehillim of Tehillim Sadi of Tehillim chapter ninety. The Noam Hashem Elokeinu Aleinu. Rashi in his commentary on Tehillim says the following. Noam, what is Noam? What is the pleasantness of the divine, the pleasantness of Hashem? Shechinato v'tanchumav. His divine presence and his consolation. His divine presence and his consolation. Meaning that we are consoled by the fact that indeed, at the end of the day, our the work of our hands can be a resting place for the divine. Our small, finite contributions can be a resting place for the infinite. And that is indeed what is going on in the building of the sukkah. The building of the sukkah, each individual person builds their own personal sukkah, which is a reflection of the ultimate sukkah. The ultimate sukkah that began to be built by the Jewish people on the 15th of Tishrei, the Mishkan, which was a small structure of animal skins and beams of wood. And this small structure was able to contain, as it were. It was able to contain Kabbalah Yochel, the, the, the divine presence itself. And this was the prayer of Moshe Rabbeinu, that this, impossible, that this impossible task would be able to be done. And this is indeed what the Jewish people accomplished collectively. In every Sukkot, every single, every single 15th of Tishrei, we commemorate this in our own personal, in our own personal sphere. We create a structure that is halachically mandated to be flimsy, to be not permanent. It's not meant to be permanent. It's not meant to be strong and stable in and of itself. It's meant to reflect the reality. We try to escape this reality by building strong structures and achieving some type of security and having this superficial sense of stability. But during Sukkot, we address reality as it is, that all of reality, regardless of how much we reinforce it, regardless of how much we invest in it, reality is by definition flimsy. And we lean into that discomfort. We lean into that reality. That our world, as we experience it, is inherently flimsy. But that's okay. Because even though it's inherently flimsy, we don't want it to be, in and of itself, strong. We want it to be a resting place for the divine. We want it to be a resting place for the Shekhinah. Rebbe Eliezer and Rebbe Akiva are two sides of the same sukkah coin, as it were. Rabbi Lezer is expressing in essence what is going on. In essence, it's the Anane HaKavod that are resting upon the Jewish people. But Rabbi Akiva brings the insight. We're not waiting for the Anane HaKavod to descend by themselves. We erect a sukkah. We erect a physical structure. And that flimsy physical structure becomes the resting place for those Anane HaKavod. And this is what we are attempting to do. And this is what we do accomplish every year when we have the throwback to the original to the original Chag of the Jewish people, the original celebration of the Jewish people, that the Divine Presence was able to return back to the collective, was able to return back to the nation after it was banished due to the hate of the Egel. I would just like to say the quiet part out loud if it has, hasn't already been received. During these past many months where the entire Jewish people are collectively involved in this historic and epic struggle and each person is playing their own role in their own way and everyone has felt at least once if not many many times over that this sense of desperation to be able to do their part to make a difference to be able to contribute to be able to have their mark manifested in this grand project that's going on, that we are still in the midst of, that we are still going through. It's far from over. The sense of desperation is very, very familiar to me personally, and I'm sure it's familiar to all of you as well. This is a good yearning to have. This is a very, very good yearning to have. However, I would like to suggest 
to frame this yearning within the paradigm that we are trying to inculcate into our hearts and minds on Sukkot. And that paradigm is that we do not act in order for our actions to be independently strong. We do not act in order for our actions to be inherently effective. Obviously, we must be calculated, we must be strategic, we must act within the confines of this world. But ultimately, we do not act in order for our actions to be stand-alone enterprises. The Jewish people act in order to create a resting place for the Shekhinah. Whether that is the very embodiment of Hashra Sashrina in the Beis HaMikdash, which was acted out by the Jewish people first in the desert many thousands of years ago and continues to be acted out every Chag HaSukos, or if it's in any other endeavor in which we are engaged in. Every endeavor of ours is ultimately, ultimately, an attempt to build a resting place for the Divine Presence.